Good day, I'm Mark Pesci. And I'm at a point in my life where I'm now starting to see some of the amazing people I know reach a milestone in their lives chronologically. They're reaching the age of 60. And we think of 60 as being almost esteemed, almost a little musty in a lot of ways. But the closer I get to 60, and I'm not very far away from it, the more I understand that it's actually an amazing time because it means that in some sense you've arrived at the fullness of your wisdom. Maybe you haven't completed the journey yet, but you've been around the racetrack a couple of times and you've probably learned some things that you might want to share. And it feels as though folks in their 60s have a certain freedom. They've done what they've set out to do. Maybe they haven't finished all of their accomplishments, but they've certainly stated the premise. And I don't think there's anyone that I know who has stated the premise more clearly than my friend Douglas Rushkoff. In a number of books, I've lost count. We've all lost count. Doug may have lost count on the number of books. I'm not sure. He has laid out a map of the world that we're living in and the world that we're leading into. He has given us some guideposts. He has given us some hope. He's given us a fair number of warnings. And so, in the week that he turned 60 years old, I wanted to welcome Doug to the very first of what I'm calling these wisdom talks so that we can explore what he's learned along the way. Doug, welcome. Hey, good to be with you. Gosh. All right, let's go all the way back. So your first published book is Siberia, right? The first published book was called Free Rides. It was a, ah. there was a, um, a guy, I had written a screenplay for this guy named Patrick Wells. And uh, I actually had saw a sign in Los Angeles on a bridge. Someone had spray painted and it said, the war on drugs is just another war. And we got in a long conversation about that when I was trying to explain to, to Patrick that the war on drugs wasn't a war on drugs. It was a war on the states of consciousness that drugs offer. I mean, not the not the 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 ghetto war on drugs and abuse, but the war on drugs, the kind of drugs we like. Right, the, the, which is the war on <laughs> black people. Right, right. The, yeah. the good, the good, the good drugs. Um, and uh, and he's like, that's interesting. And I said, you know, we should do a book on ways to get high without drugs. Offer all of these states of consciousness to people, and then what are they going to do? Make meditation, masturbation, holotropic breathing, make those things illegal. And he was like, I'll pay you $10,000 to write that book and then we'll get it published. And I wrote it and then it became published. So uh, that's actually the first first, but uh, it wasn't the first book that like represents like the beginning of my opus or whatever. That would be uh, Siberia, Life in the Trenches. <laughs> your of your yeah. as it were. <laughs> Although, although, actually, it fits on a certain level. Given, I mean, there is a persistent theme in all of your works about cognitive freedom. Yes, cognitive freedom and and DIY cognitive freedom that we deserve the tools to to do this. And 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 it was the 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 premise of Siberia really was that with the emergence of. Uh, uh, not just the internet, that was just a baby at the time. It didn't really exist even at the time. It was 1991. But the, the beginnings of digital and hypertext and, and personal computers along with fractals and chaos math and fantasy role-playing games and the psychedelic revival um, and, and, and neo-paganism, that all of these uh, pointed, as I saw it, toward a kind of a designer reality, an acceptance mm. that we can hallucinate reality into existence. And, and as a journalist, I was really interested in why are big, stodgy computer companies like Intel or Northrop Grumman or any of them, why are they hiring psychedelics people to do all their work for them and warning them about drug tests before they come up? And it's because psychedelics people, my crazy friends from college, seem to have more facility, less fear of a plastic reality, of imagining things into existence. And there's this whole sort of, I guess, frame here around cognitive liberty that is expressed consistently across your books, that you find the cognitive liberty argument across a number of different regions. And so there's this continual exploration 
with this theme of cognitive liberty underneath it, but looking at it when it means money, when it means online culture, when it means psychedelic culture, when it means religion, when it means politics. Right. They're all really pointing towards the possibility of an open source reality. You know, the thing that I was arguing, you know, as soon as Wired Magazine came along and took the great Mondo 2000 cyberdelic dream of, you know, infinite play away and turned it into a stock market scam, um, I started to look at it more as kind of the battle for cyberspace, that, that the renaissance was not inevitable, that we were going to have to fight for this thing against, you know, crazy libertarians who want to do pedal to the metal economic growth rather than full-time, you know, civilization-wide play. So it, it was always that, you know, it was a media virus was really the second book that came out. And it, it not only named viral media, which is the nice thing, but, but the, the important thing about that book is, uh, is the second, is the subtitle, Hidden Agendas in Popular Culture. The idea that now that we had viral media, mm. that, that the, the repressed ideas, gay culture, drug culture, counterculture, all these things would start to bubble up. William Randolph Hearst wouldn't be able to, Rupert Murdoch wouldn't be able to keep it down anymore. It was going to be bottom up. The next one uh, was, was playing the future. That was kids. You know, we're going to play. We're going to game our way into this yeah. thing. You know, the kids are all right. Don't you worry about them. They're screenagers. They're more literate um, than you. You know, coercion came out after that. Again, about the battle. The the I said it explicitly. We are in an arms race against marketers and advertisers. They come up with a new mind control technique. We come up with a new form of resistance. They do a countermeasure. We do a countermeasure. Where's it going to go? Because someday, and this was 1998, I was arguing this, they are going to develop algorithms that will adapt to our defense mechanisms. And what are we going to do when we're fighting against that? And, and where is it going to go when we are engaging with algorithms that want us to be more ourselves than we already are. They want to make us into extreme versions of ourselves. And people were asking, why, what's, what's wrong with that? Why wouldn't I want to be an extreme version of me? You know, and the only ones that got it at the time, oddly because, enough. Because then all of a sudden you're in the capital. Right. Then all of a sudden you're in the Capitol dome wearing a Viking hat. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. The only one that had me on the show and was right. like, yes, I get it, was Bill fucking O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly of the O'Reilly Report on Fox. He had me on for coercion. And he's like, you're right. You're right. This is going <laughs> to. But everybody else was like thinking I'm, I'm, I'm suddenly a conservative or something. It's like, no. Uh, but it took a while. And then, of course, you know, of course, we got there. Yeah. <laughs> And then after that, I got concerned with, you know, uh, we, got, uh, we got there, you know, I started to look at other things that were being locked off. You know, I got interested in how did Judaism start as an open source religion and then become this dry, locked down, you know, holy, sacred thing. You know, it's because they used it as a real estate deed instead of, you know, a, a spiritual text. You know, if you if you need it to prove something, it's going to lose all of its, you know, multidimensional uh, metaphorical value, its allegorical value is going to be collapsed into the legal value. I, I looked at money. You know, all you have to do when you want to fight for open source is say, what aren't they letting us? What's not open source? God and money. You know, but those are the most mm. open source things <laughs> that could possibly exist, as you know. These are the inventions. That's all we've got is God yes. and money. That's all we've made up, really. <laughs> it's the only fictional <laughs> thing. <laughs> Everything else is real. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've got that idea here that there is a space that we were offered uh, that opened up to us. And you can argue about its roots. And Adam Curtis has one history of its roots. Stuart Brand has another history of its right. roots. Howard Rheingold has another history. You have another history. I have an, We all have histories that give us a sense of how we got to this place. But we are all, in some sense, united in the fact that we are now all in a place that we didn't really want to get to, right? That there are, there has been a consequential outcome 
to all of our behavior. And we're also now wondering whether this is a consequential outcome to the product of our play, or is it a consequential outcome to the block, the resistance to that play? Right? Like these are questions that we're now really being forced to answer that are in different ways becoming central questions of culture. Right. I mean, and I'd be strongly arguing that this resulted from the block on our play. You know, I read uh, Heusinger's book, Homo Ludens, which was, you know, kind of profound for me. And in there, he was talking about the nature of play. And, you know, and he says kind of famously in there, you know, most of us think that dogs play in order to train themselves for the hunt. And he's like, no, dogs hunt in order to have the energy to play, you know, so play is the point of the thing. And he talks about the sacred circle around play. And once you apply play, it's no longer play. Once you're playing for the money, playing the stock market, playing a thing, you're not playing, you're working. You're, you're so gamification of real things is, is, is crap. When play, it's for its own sake. It's like the, the great rabbis, when they were asked, what's the reason to read Torah? Is it to uh, they ask, is it to become, is it to learn social justice in order to be a better person, or is it to learn the history of our people? And the rabbi said, neither. It's lishma. And so what's that? It's it's like you read you read the Torah to read the Torah. <laughs> it's for its own sake you do it, and that play is like that. It's play is for its own sake, and. And when you play for your own sake, the beauty, and this was the craziness, why we loved the early internet, is we became creative and less predictable. We became weird. There was novelty. And mm. novelty is upsetting to people who want to do business. They look to computers for the opposite purpose. They want to make money on it. They want to speculate on the future. And when you speculate on the future... You want the future to be as predictable as possible. You don't want to speculate on a random yeah. creative You have future. to narrow down possibility. Right. And so they used these technologies to narrow down the possibility, to program human beings into you know, categories of compliance. And that's why we, we, we're so, so upset. So let me, let me take this in a, an, an orthogonal direction to something that I've seen. It certainly was an outcome of, some, of the interview that I did with you recently, that in fact, people started to come to me because we started to talk about magic in that mm. interview. And they came to me and said, well, you seem to understand some stuff about magic and where this is all going. And they wanted me to sort of engage them in a dialogue. And when I started to engage them in a dialogue, it seemed as though their understanding of magic was quite instrumentalist, that it was a tool to power, right? Which is, you know, and there are antecedents in, as we know, modern magical practice around the fact that it's being conceived as power. And I actually took one of them and said, let's turn this inside out. Maybe we're the tool being used by the magic mm. and not that w magic is the tool that we're wielding. And it blew their minds because it was so outside the frame that they were capable of playing in. So that when they defined their magic circle, they basically drained all the power out of the magic that was in the circle before they could say, oh, there's a circle here. And I mm. wonder if that isn't a, yet another outcome of the way we've really framed everything. I mean, it comes back to that Heideggerian, Heideggerian concept of unframling, right? That a technology right. frames something and therefore in some sense deactivates it, right? Have we done this progressively to more and more of our play systems? Well, we've done it to more and more of life. You know, the, you could look at it, you know, in closing the commons is mm. a version of that. Uh, uh, even the English language naming something, you know, that we have all these nouns, that is a house, that is a dog, you are a man, I am a this, you know. So once you're doing, you're already, and, and speaking could be an incantation or it can be this yes. other thing, this concatenation, this, this condensation, you know, and, and yeah. so I kind of, I kind of look at it, look at it all that way. But yeah, we, uh, part of the problem is that, is that 
we kind of surrender technology, not just to the libertarians, but to scientism in a certain way. You know, we started to see it as so tech as like STEM, as rational as for those guys. Mm. And the tech, mm. when I was introduced to it, was by the other team. You know, it was not by the scientists, the, the scientists, <laughs> people, it was by the magical people. It was the ones who were, you know, working at Intel all day and then going home at night to, to Oakland and scraping the peyote off the cactus and tripping their balls off. You know, and it was... And to them, these were yes, one exactly. and the same, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think, and, and that's that, that purposeful forgetting or misplacement of the boundary, rather than saying that there's an, an A team and a B team, that there's a science team and a creative, whatever you want to call it, team, linguistic yeah. team, maybe we can call it that, or m imaginal team. That rather than that, that that's saying that these are two sides of the same coin. And I find particularly as I become more and more inside of and comfortable with my own magical practice, there was a period of time in the 90s when I was very open about it. And most of the time, while I continually have practiced, I don't really front burner that because people will tend to pigeonhole you as this other thing. And now, as I approach that 60th, as I approach that sort of fullness, I'm getting it back and I'm being quite open about it, but I am still surprised at the way that people would say, but Mark, you're so sciencey, right? <laughs> How can you believe this stuff? And I'm like, ah. Uh... And the way I've always understood all of it, whether it's science or it's magic, is that of course we understand the world by descriptions, right? Descriptions are what we've got at the end of the day. Right. And we have many different routes to descriptions, some of which are fundamentally internal and relational, and some of which are external and, without being too instrumental about it, transactional. Right. And it's up to us to find the balance in those rather than to say, well, the transactional is real and the imaginal is not real or the imaginal is real and the transactional is not real. It feels like people can't grasp the nuance there. Right. They pick a team and then fight over it. You yeah, know? exactly. And it's like, it's like whatever, I, I was going to say whatever floats your boat, but it's not even that. It's like whatever works best in that situation is what you do in that situation so we're building a bridge yeah. and i want trucks to be able to go over it and not fall into the swamp give me some real math yes. here to make that work right you know yeah but you know when i want yeah. to sing a song with my family while we're crossing and, and the keeping bridge, in mind yeah. yeah that the first hundred years that we built bridges there were no fancy maths and they did fall down <laughs> and the carts did fall into the sea the tay river bridge in Scotland is the classic example right. of this. And we developed the discipline in engineering as a result of those horrible failures because we didn't fully, I guess, encompass that description. Right. But the thing is, it's like, if I find out I've got really bad cancer, I want the best Sloan Kettering yeah. fucking chemotherapy radiation, just slam it on me. But... yeah. In order to not get cancer, in order, I want the most holistic, you know, greeny, craniosacral, <laughs> chakric, tantric, whatever exactly. that there is. So I want to feed exactly. my energetic body and all that. But but in crisis, science, you know. So yeah, they they all work. It's just a matter of uh, how you're using them. You know, the people that really want to have power over others rather than power with others, they mm. tend to gravitate towards the more, well, the more controlling uh, uh, sides of any of these. They want to do magic to get something from that other person or to make something manifest for themselves. I'm going to wish for money. Or they look at now, usually more, they'll look to money and science and tech as ways of, you know, oh, I'm going to do some surveillance capitalism or program these people into oblivion or, uh, you know, get them to click more on my on my icon. 
or invent a new form of money and get people to believe that it contains value and therefore makes me rich because I hold a lot of it. Yeah. Which is yeah, quite exactly. popular these days. It's rich, make them believe it until the moment before, the moment after I sell it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Token exactly. baby. I so, want my I want my Mark Pesci <laughs> token. What are those called? My NFT. <laughs> Tokens. I want my and my my Yeah, exactly. So this is one of the things that is is becoming clearer, and, and I feel as though you really started to touch on this in both Team Human, but also in the book about money, all right, is that we're now seeing the pervasive financialization of absolutely everything. And of course, Frederick Jameson warned, warned us about this in, you know, postmodernism or the, the dialectic of late capitalism. Uh, I believe that Piketty is warning us about this in Capital, that we're seeing the ultimate financialization of everything. And one of the things that's become clearer and clearer to me is that machines make very good transactional entities. People make very poor transactional entities. On the other hand, humans make very good relational entities and machines make very poor relational entities. Yeah. And so are we missing something about how we should be using the profound magic that is money? Are we putting it in the wrong places? Yeah, well, we're 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 quantifying aspects of reality that shouldn't be quantified. It's interesting. Mm. You know the the Talmud I keep going back to Judaism. The Talmud says you shouldn't count people. Even when you're trying to assemble a minion right. for a prayer, you don't count human beings. Right. You know, the surrender during the Roman census, all right, we'll count, oh, we'll count. Except, yeah. except when God says it's okay. Right. Right? God God said, I think, twice he said you could number the people, but that was it. Right. It was like after you did a, we counted after Sinai or something. You know, it was like a couple of moments in history. Yeah. It's like, how many? How many? Were there Shmuley? Moishi? Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> You can't. You're, there were a few moments when you were, but yeah. Be, but to me, I always took that as you know the danger in over quantification. And I understand this goes back to Francis Bacon and empirical mm. science, and he really saw that that quantification would allow us to, as I always like to quote him, take nature by the forelock, hold her down, and submit her to our will. That's his. And that's what he thought empirical science and quantification could do. And we've been quantifying things right through the industrial age. And, and he got that right. He did. He did. That's what it was yeah. for. And now we're not just quantifying, we're quantizing, which is even another level of weird. You know, so quantizing is taking human voices and auto-tuning them to particular quantum notes. It's it's taking the soft squishiness of reality and finding which line to put it on. Now, that's really friendly to the market that's looking to create a numerical value for each thing. But it's really bad for, for it's black and white. It's everything has its number and its value and you lose the texture and experiential nature of, of everything. It's like, oh, how much? Uh, we just made love. How much was that one worth? That was about a 230 out of 340. It's like, oh, but last night, you know, let's go, no, 171. Oh, for me, it was a 426. You know, and it's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? What are you, what are you doing? It's like, oh, don't worry. You know, we could, we could fix this by creating more categories through which you can judge. So for friction, it was a 37. For, Sorry. you know, passion, it was a 101. For this, it's, it doesn't matter how many you have because you're still just doing this and that's not life. This is for the market, yeah. right? And that's great. I'm going in. I got seven chickens. I want some shoes. Yeah. How much is this? <laughs> you know, and you figure it out. But but life, it's like you're going to lose that game. You know, there's, <laughs> there's no – there's Elon Musk won. Okay, he won. He's got the most numbers. Yay. Oh no, he's he's down he's down twenty billion as we're recording this. He's down twenty billion dollars. So this Bezos morning. might be back up. Jeff might be. Ah! Up. <laughs> he might be back up. Yeah, it's crazy. you win some, you lose some. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, uh, this is. I, I, how did we get to a point where? And I don't think this is particularly a twenty-first or even twentieth-century phenomenon. It's probably more a phenomenon of modernity where great wealth has been equated to great virtue. 
it's a na- it's a natural reverse engineering of our instinct for justice. You know, I I, I felt this in like 1998 or 99. I was writing one of the books, and I was in Redwood city or something like that. It's this rich suburb of San Francisco. And I'm driving and it's like mansion after mansion after mansion. And I felt myself wondering, what did these people do for society to deserve to live in these houses? They must have just created so much value. And then I realized they probably they probably just took money from other people. You know, they they weren't good at creating value. They were probably good at extracting value, right, from other things. And bad. it wasn't until then, and I'm already 30 years old, that I realized what you're saying is not true, right? That no, that 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 it's not virtue, it's a certain kind of success and and most often equates to the reverse of virtue that when you actually and finally when you get important and you get to talk to these people you find out they're all shielding their children and families from the work that they do you know <laughs> they're making apps for the iPad and they don't let their kids touch it they're sending their kids from the great lie yeah yeah to the Rudolf Steiner school and eating organic yeah. food and not touching anything they make it's like okay you know that must be a fun life Well, it tells you that they're living with a kind of cognitive dissonance, which is walling them off. In other words, they're completely comfortable being extractive in the transactional part of their lives, but in the relational part of their lives, they're they're compensating or perhaps even overcompensating for that transactionality, for the cost that it's producing inside of them to put up that front of this continuous transactionality that you need to have that extractive mindset, right? You need to sort of be quite separate and split inside of yourself. And so they restore that by overcompensating and sending the kids to a Steiner school and all of that stuff. Right. It's what what I've been calling the insulation equation. You know, where they think, how much money do I have to earn to insulate myself from the reality I'm creating by earning money in that way? You know, and there's no way to win that. You can never make a car that drives fast enough to escape from your own exhaust. You'll eventually come back around the other side of the world and be stack, smack in the middle of it. You know, and that's that's the way they live their lives. And as as we know, the Buddhist maxim is quite clear on this. Karma is a bitch. It is, but it comes it come it karma's way faster than people expect. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Which is so pleasing. Exactly. It is. It, it, <laughs> it's, well, until it's your own. Right. And then you have a bit more of a moment around that. Because yeah. none of us, let's face it, none of us are perfect. All right. So let's come back to the meta theme here. You are now 60. All right. What have you learned along the way about how to be the best Douglas Rushkoff that you can be? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to think of what, what I've learned lately. In other words, what feels like a cumulative learn. Um, one cumulative learn that I, I've only realized now as, or so as I've gotten older, I've gotten less afraid to, to be who I am, say what I think and all that. And I've gotten lately, partly because of the whole QAnon thing and all what's going on in politics and COVID, I've had some some friends really mad at me or or scold me or reject me or not be friends anymore and all. And um, what I what I came to realize is, um, you know, maybe God is the only one who can give us grace, but people are the only ones Mm -hmm. who can give us slack and people are just not generous enough with their slack. They're just not. And it's like, that's pretty much all you can offer someone else. Almost more than love, you know, is, is, is because what's love without slack. You know, that's conditional. Just give me fucking slack. Give everybody it's, slack. It's, it's stiff. It's yeah. stiff, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's that, you know, and it's partly uh, because I see my faults. I see my errors. I see the, the the problems I've done and all that. But it's like, 
Who hasn't? Who hasn't? So what? So now what? What do you want to do? What are we supposed to do about that? You know, all you can do is cut me slack. That's all you can do. And and when I look at the world now, I'm yeah. seeing people getting increasingly stiff on all sides of the spectrum. You know, especially now that we're moving into a memory based media environment, everything we've ever done is going to be retrievable by anyone at any time. So if our standards on what it is to be a good human being are changing from moment to moment, then we're all accumulating histories of inappropriate thoughts, inappropriate things we've said. And it necessitates more slack, not less. So that's sort of a big, that's a big one for me right now. And it, it, I, I think that is so beautifully put because there's a practice in that, right? There is a practice of looking out on other human beings as worthy of having some slack and also that there's a humility that, yeah, I'm going to need some slack too, right? So it works beautifully in both directions. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's the basis of a practice there around slack, you know, which, I mean, is this the next generation of the subgenius? Because subgenius was very much, give me some slack. I know. Right? Well, then that was formative for me. It was slack and slacker and Rick Linkletter and subgenius yeah. and all that. That's when we were just coming into awareness, where those were the memes that yeah. were that were circulating. So it, it's kind of not surprising that that would get uh, uh, retrieved, you know, at, at this point. And. Uh, all right. Look at. Yeah. We, as Generation X, and I consider you roughly the elder in Generation X, all right? I'm just a little bit behind you, and then there's going to be a whole cohort. But it's actually kind of a thin layer in a sandwich yeah. that has a huge chunk of baby boomers and a huge chunk of millennials and Gen Zers coming after it. We are being left with, to put it mildly, a shit sandwich. Yeah. And I'm not blaming the baby boomers because none of us really knew what was going to happen when we let all these genies out of the bottle, but we are still left with a substantial amount of work. It sort of feels like what Biden walked up to on the first day in office. There's a lot of work here to do. I don't think any of us are afraid of that work. What do we need to feel in ourselves around how we approach that? Because some of the remediation does fall on us. And I think also building that ethic of remediation into the people who will come after us as a practice. How do we want to think about that? Because it feels like that's also one of the themes of your whole career. Yeah, I mean, there's a strain of almost prophetic Judaism in what I do on, you know, how, what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? You know, you know, uh, uh, stand up and, and take responsibility and, and, and get, look at someone in the eyes and engage with them and be, you know, there's, there's, there is that. Um, I spent a lot of time and maybe this is another 60 per 60 year old person's wisdom that I can save someone else time. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, should we spend our energy trying to remediate the problems or should we be doing palliative care for a civilization that's dying? And what I came to realize is they're actually the same thing. It's the same actions. So the kinds of things you would do to prepare for inevitable climate disaster are really the same things that you would do to prevent mm. a climate disaster, right? Get into hand-grown food and biodynamics and uh, uh, energy resilience and learn, your learn who your neighbors are. And you know, those are the things that would prepare you for the, the, the EMP, you know, or whatever is coming, and it would also help prevent whatever that whatever that nasty thing is. And so I look at it the same way. And it's it's you know being kind, offering slack, you know, nurturing other people. Um, is this? It's if you treated everybody like they were on their deathbed, essentially, like we're all, you know, what is that? What does that frame mm. do? It doesn't have to be a depressing thing. And I've spent a lot of time, I've, met, I've, I've seen a lot of people no. out. And it's, it's the greatest mitzvah I could ever yeah. have experienced. It's such an honor to be there for their passage. You know, oh. Agree. 
Agreed. It's the thing. So even if we are at that stage Agreed. for the whole thing, it's it's it would be terrible, but yeah. it's a mitzvah. So treat it like that anyway. Treat it like that anyway, but it's not out of fear or panic and end of the world walking dead thing. It's like, wow, this is a really sacred moment. You know, this is a sacred moment. And and we don't have to go. It doesn't have to go that way. The more like that we act, the less likely it is that that would that that would come to that that would come to fruition. But I, I've stopped. I, I've realized it's an it's an artificial question to be asking. Is this it? You know, and because why would I behave differently if it was it? Act as if it's it all the friggin' time. It's it, right? Because this is all, this is it. So that sort of happened, you know, and it makes time and, I mean, so much less scary. We we because we. In the sense that the end doesn't feel quite so terminal. Yeah, and that your moment becomes infinite. If you're really here, you're really the when the moment becomes infinite, then the mm. next one doesn't matter. And you just fall into that infinity of the, you know, the good old Ram Das be here now. It's like, oh, if I was really, really I mean, I haven't gotten more than eighty percent here, I'm sure, ever. But, you know, you can imagine <laughs> <laughs> what that what that is so if you actually fall into the yeah. moment then you know that 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 changes things it changes things too you know but it's so hard as a younger person to not look at life as a journey of uh, uh, accumulation or I'm going to get somewhere and achieve something and make it to somewhere and all that and what I will tell you is this no matter how far you make it there's always the next Thing. You're never there. I did an interview when I was like 25 with David Lynch, filmmaker, and I thought, you know, he had made it, right? He had made it. So I'm like, what's it like on the inside? What's it like on the other side of having made it? And he's like, kid, there's no such thing. You're, you're never there. There's always, you're, it, there's no place to get. And it's just like realizing that finally at 60. Um, oh, that's what he meant. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's it's liberating because you're like, oh, I get it. There's nowhere to go. There's no winner. The winning, even winning as a concept is just an act of separation. Now I'm the winner. You know, oh, great. <laughs> Come on back. Well, and it's <laughs> exactly. And it's it's and again, you leave that space of the game because when you have the space, the, the sacred space of play, it's not about winning. Right. It's about being in the space of okay. play. Right. right. And so as soon as you make it winner, you've made it work. Right. Which is James right. Karsh. That's the whole finite and infinite games idea. You know, that there's finite games or games you win and the game ends. Infinite games are games where you play to keep the game going. That's the object of the game. And that's why fantasy role playing was so exciting to me. Why the Internet was exciting. I was a theater kid. Right, I was a theater kid, but I got fed up with the Aristotelian arc that crisis, climax, rest. You know, the male orgasm curve of of you know of, of tragic theater. And I was like, the internet is going to be a hyperspace. Keep going, keep opening more openings, more connections, more. It's just you know what I mean. It's going to keep going. And it was like, oh, this is a sustainable. This is play, baby. This is you know better than a play. This is real play. Um, but boy, we so fast turned it into an even worse, more closed ended money making dot com yeah. boom startup exit strategy, you know, thing. Uh, I, I was I was amazed it went that way. And anybody who doesn't understand how that happened, just look at the evolution of Bitcoin. Right. It comes out of Occupy as a way to take down Wall Street, really, as a new uh, peer to peer system. And it becomes the biggest friggin uh, speculative frenzy. Uh, uh, you know, it reified Wall Street rather than since the tulip down. mania. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, you know, when we, we talk about that kind of the play that we have there and the way that that's been constrained and to come back to the original theme that people are always going to try to break out of the coercive cages that they get put into. I actually do look for all of the difficulty and danger of a QAnon. I also see that as being an authentically organic reaction to the heavy management that every time the system tries to enclose it, it imaginatively and 
multivariously leaps over those boundaries. Hey, what if? They're all saying to one another all the time, hey, what if? And yes, it's all crazy. But they're all still going, wait, there's no boundary here. I'm going to leap over that boundary and go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Yeah. And so there's something about it as crazy and, and not good as I feel that it is. There's also something about it that's like, whoa. Well, yeah. The part that's so beautiful about it is it's the best example of the, the improv theater makers yes and technique. You know, when you're doing improv, the idea is you say, oh, you know, uh, I was walking down the street. Yes. And you saw a chicken. Yes. And, and. the chicken was red and dying. And you know, so yes. And is how you build and. a world together. Yes, yes. And never, but, you know, never, but no, it's yes. And yes. And, and they're playing yes. And in this beautiful way together in a supportive. Oh, so Bill Gates made COVID. Yeah. So he could stick vaccines in us that have nanobots that will program us to listen to 5g channels. And it's like, Oh, it'll keep going. It's beautiful. Right. But the real, so I that George Soros can control <laughs> us, Doug. Right. Always, always. And eat my baby's brains. Right. Always. Always. It always comes back to the Jews. Believe me. It always does. That's what we're here for. Uh, but uh, yeah, it always comes back to the blood libel. I exactly. get it. I get it. It's, that's what it's there. But the other interesting yeah. thing about Q it, that, that, that you, 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 you make me think of is that the, the, the QAnon and conspiracy theory and all these things are also responses to this kind of technocratic, soulless organization of people when they look at the great reset and oh we're going to use sensors to put every living item on the blockchain and then give uh, stakeholders capitalism and you oh don't worry we're going to give you money we're going to give you welfare we're going to give you that and people are saying you know fuck man it's not money i want it's dignity it's my basic dignity that i want you know and i was i was watching of all things the crown on Netflix, you know, it's this thing about the queen mm -hmm. and the baby queen is in her class learning about what queens are for. And the guy, the teacher says, look, we've got, you know, basically we've got government is here for efficiency and the queen is here for dignity. And I was thinking, you know, that's part of what America wanted in a, sorry, in a Trump, even though I know he's not a dignified presence, but he was offering something other than the utilitarian value of government. He was offering people yes. who feel stepped on a sense of dignity, of pride. And the, 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 the American experiment has failed in the sense that the enlightenment, the enlightenment gives us the cloud but it doesn't give us meaning. It doesn't give us soul. And that's what, what Americans are lacking. But it was always the intention of the founding fathers that each person should be able to find their own path into that. I mean, if you take a look at Jefferson and Franklin, particularly, that this is these are ideas that they would have been centered on, although even at the time, those ideas probably would have seemed quite heretical, right, to the most of the population. But I think that they felt that an enlightened polity would be able to find its own way into dignity. But what we found maybe is that capitalism can give you goods, but what it can't do because it's just because it's transactional and not relational and because dignity is fundamentally relational is that it cannot deliver dignity. Right. Right. And civics, you know, I guess that's the thing. Civics is really not about dignity in that sense. It's about it's about something else. We've got this false notion really since Oprah maybe and Rodney King and all that the problem is that we why can't we all just get along? You know, it's kind of this idea of, of friendship. If we could all just be friends, then it would work. And Fraternity. You know, yeah. But, you know, I don't have to be your friend. You don't have to be my friend. You just we just have to share a sense of mutual responsibility for one another. You know, we, that's civics. Civics. I went to the town meeting about the school budget here last year or the year before. An old woman got up and she said, I don't understand why I have to pay the school tax if I don't have any kids in the school. And I was like, OK, that's the it. But it's the perennial question in a town meeting. Right. 
right? Because they don't understand civics. They don't understand, you know, would in America, would the public library system get started today? Of course not. They don't make money. What were you going to, what's the profit model? It makes no sense. We're going to pay for people to read books. They can buy their own fucking books. You know, so we don't, it's like, it's, it's just not in our, in our, our, our working vocabulary. Right. And there's this idea of consequential thinking, which is that that lady who's making that objection doesn't understand that if there are a whole bunch of poorly educated children running around, that that, in fact, ruins the environment for her far beyond anything she has to front up to pay for the school. Right. Who's going to pay for your welfare in 10 years? Who's going to be your home health care aide? Right. Who's going to be fixing your car? You know, it's like, yeah, people don't people don't. They don't get that. And that's that's a largely American problem where we think, you know, you just earn enough money to pay for the thing. You just earn your earn money you. to pay for it, you know, like anybody else. All right. We're kind of getting to the end of this. It is, as always, an unadulterated pleasure to engage with you on this. Take a look forward for yourself. All right. What are the things that you I I don't want to stress the frame this as desire, because it feels like that's the thing that we're kind of rubbing up against here. Right. What are the things that you find rubbing up against desire? I love that phrase. It's beautiful. What do you find yourself moving toward? Um, I find myself moving back to theater. Um. I oddly enough have gotten interested again in lost medieval theater, which I think is very applicable. Like mystery plays and things. The mystery plays. Uh-huh. Um, Cervantes wrote these plays called the Entremeses that I think almost nobody understands what they are, except me. Um, <laughs> nobody does them, I and mean, because they're terrible, they're terrible. Unless you go, oh, I get it. They're crypto Judaic. I believe that Cervantes was a secret Jew and each of these Mm -hmm. plays, each of these eight plays, like one of them is a play about a, it's a emperor with no clothes kind of a story. It's a puppeteer comes to town with these puppets and you can only see the puppets if you're a 100% pure blood Catholic. And everybody says, Oh, I can see the puppets. I can see the puppets. And it's him going, "Ah." You know, we converted, we converted for you and you're still cutting off our heads. What do you want here? It's like, so each of these plays to me has a, a, a similar uh, uh, theme in it. If only people realize, oh, that's what they're about. Um, so I want to do th- things like that, but I also want to do community theater. I want to create, uh, I, I've, I've come to the belief that that almost nobody should do theater professionally, but everybody should do theater at some point in their life. You know, mm. I think it's part of growing up is experiencing what that is, this artificial, uh, you're in the audience, I'm on the stage, you're going to be quiet, I'm going to do this thing, I'm pretending that I'm really in some, it's just, it's it's a really unique experience of fabricating a reality. So I want to create these scenes that are kind of stealth, I shouldn't admit it out loud, but kind of stealth left wing ideology in the form of skeletal scenes that will be sent to schools and communities all over the country to get like thousands of small community theater groups doing these kind of almost WPA style theater that they don't realize is that it'll just be like a scene that's like a between a worker and a boss but i don't say where it is so you've got to set it in a walmart in the bible and the stock market in the future in the past and you end up exploring power relationships between workers and bosses mm-hmm. and labor and that and then the idea is you know they would upload their scenes in their interpretations to youtube then we'd pick some of them and fly them to New York or to Chicago or to LA and let them do these scenes in repertory, you know, so you get the, you know, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, middle school players, you know, at the Joe Papps public theater doing their scenes. Um, it's just like, just crazy. So I, I want to kind of, uh, 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 poke at community theater as the, the, and, and, and I'm not, I, I'm old enough to say this. I think community theater is more important than Broadway theater. I think that's where it happens. The doing of theater is the center of theater, not the most professional 
uh, uh, yeah. theater actor. And it's the, it's the darshan. It's the being in the cast or being in the audience together, yeah. which is because Broadway takes a very small number of people in. It just has to because it's a very narrow channel. You have to come to New York. And, you know, for most of the world, that's just not going to work, right? So, yes, this idea of being able to do it. And again, this is you coming back to your roots in open source. This is open source theater. Open source theater, right. Exactly. So what it really was was so the story of my life is I'm a theater guy who got it who got interested in digital because it seemed more open source than the theater I was doing. Digital became the most closed source speculative capitalist abstracted frenzy I've ever maybe ever to be on the planet and I'm returning to theater with the lessons I got through that getting to watch a civilization grow and destroy itself in 25 years. Now bring that back to the theater and see what see what I can make of it. Douglas, this has been an incredible journey. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for being on this journey with me for for all these years. It's a uh, boy without without teammates, it would be a hell of a lot scarier. <laughs>